the name of the teaching is saved or born again. We've talked about this before. And there is a difference between somebody who's saved and somebody who's born again. Now, now don't get me wrong. I, I'm not trying to bring division. Not trying to condemn anybody else who says, well, when you're saved, you're born again, and so forth. You know, to me, it doesn't matter. Okay? I mean, people come to the altar. They say, well, will you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. You're born again. Well, you know, that's between them and God. But I know through my experience that I have met people that said that they were born again, and I know they weren't. There was something not right. And it always pondered in my heart why, just because somebody says, I receive Jesus Christ as Lord and your Savior, that they're born again. I didn't understand it. Now, we kind of use that, and I don't want to say slang, but it became, becomes a common thing. Well, you receive Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, you're born again. Now, I'm not saying that that can't happen. Because it can happen. Somebody can be in the service that says, I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior and get baptized in the Holy Ghost. And they get born again. Because that happened with me. I asked Jesus to come in my heart. The next thing I know, a cloud came around me. I was filled and baptized in the Holy Ghost. But I was looking for the Holy Ghost too. Does everybody understand that? Because I was in a service where they were praying in tongues and I wanted all what they had. And there is a manifestation of being baptized in the Holy Ghost. There's a tangible manifestation, not only of power, but one of the tangible manifestations is tongues. So I want to talk a little bit about saved or born again. And I want to back this up in Scripture. Let's go to Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, 26 through 28. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So we see that God's intention was to create man in his image and his likeness. And he did. He created Adam in his image and his likeness. As a matter of fact, <laughs> Adam was created in God's image and likeness because God is male-female, isn't he? Adam was created as a man, but he was created in God's image and likeness. In fact, Adam's character was a representation and a reflection of God himself, wasn't it? Adam didn't know anything evil or bad. In fact, Eve came from who? Adam. So the female came out of the male. So we see now God separated male and female and brought both of them as a part of his image and likeness. That's why marriages are blessed, aren't they? Because a marriage is blessed when a man and woman become one flesh. That's a reflection of God's image and likeness. Male, female. Okay? Now we see here, Adam was born, wasn't he? But he wasn't born from a woman. He was created by God. The first thing that God did was he took dust, didn't he? And he formed man. Then he breathed in him his spirit. God put through the nostrils of Adam, he put his spirit, known as the breath of life. Or, and that's where Adam became a what? Living soul. It was the breath that brought life, not the dust. Now listen, when you become in the likeness of God and his image and likeness, something follows. It's called blessings. Now listen, God created Adam and his likeness and image. He took Eve from Adam, didn't he? And what did he do? He blessed them and he said, be what? Fruitful and multiply. He said, be fruitful and multiply. Now we know, or we, we can also say that the fruitfulness and multiplying was a representation of the inheritance of God, wasn't it? Be fruitful and multiply. And what they were doing was they were bearing fruit that what? multiplies. Things that they were doing were multiplying. It was good fruit, wasn't it? They were in the garden. Things that they were doing were 
multiplying. Adam sinned, right? Eve sinned. And they lost it all. They lost the image and likeness of God. Why? Because God's image and likeness is pure and holy, isn't it? It's not a sinful nature, is it? It's a holy nature. So when Adam and Eve fell, they lost that state of being. Not only did they lose that state of being, but they lost the inheritance of God, the multiplying and the blessing. Now, we know that they eventually multiplied, didn't they? Because God did something in the garden. He reestablished part of it, but he didn't reestablish all of it, did he? That's when he, what, killed the animal to cover them. Actually, what was he doing? Covering their sin. So he was making a way through blood. Now, let's go to uh, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. Now, it says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Now, this was the sin, wasn't it? And something happened. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Do you ever notice that the opposite of evil is live? If you were to take the word E-V-I-L, and turn it around, L-I-V-E, it means live. So we know that evilness produces death and righteousness produces life. What happened here, they ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, didn't they? That fruit was bearing, that tree was bearing fruit, wasn't it? Fruit has seed in it. What they did was they took the fruit, ate the fruit, it was that corruptible seed that caused the sin. They were actually carrying sin with the seed of the tree. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil was producing corruptible seed. Does everybody understand that? So if you were going to eat of the fruit, you were going to inherit corruptible seed, weren't you? So what happened was when the Bible says that Eve ate and then gave it to her husband. Well, Eve wasn't there when she ate. I mean, Adam wasn't there when, she, when Eve ate. Does everybody understand that? Adam wasn't there. That's why the devil lured her to the tree, didn't he? Without Adam there. Because Adam would not allow it to happen. Then, the corruptible seed which was imparted in Eve, who was deceived, allowed access of Satan, didn't it? To use her, because it was his corruptible seed, wasn't it? Now he used her to bring the fruit to Adam. In fact, Eve didn't change until when? Adam ate. When Adam ate, then both of their eyes were opened because Adam was the head of the house. And the house divided will not stand. Let's go a little further. In Genesis 3, in verse 22. Then the Lord said, Behold, the man has become like us to know good and evil. And now, lest he, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. And he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. Now, we know that God knows all things, doesn't he? He knows good and evil, doesn't he? Adam and Eve did not know good and evil. The only thing they knew was purity and fellowship with God. In fact, their spirit, soul, and body were one. It wasn't until they took the corruptible seed that their spirit, soul, and body became divided and they put on flesh. The Bible says in Leviticus that the life of the flesh is in the blood. The life of your flesh is in your blood. Corruptible flesh survives by blood, doesn't it? Adam's and Eve's flesh was glorified. They were clothed in the glory of God. Do you remember when Jesus rose from the dead? He had a glorified body, didn't he? In fact, he appeared to them, and he said, and they, they thought he was a spirit at first, didn't he? Didn't they? And he said, a spirit doesn't have flesh and bone. He never mentioned blood. In fact, the Bible says you are the... Adam said, when Eve came from Adam, he says, you are the bone of my bone and the what? Flesh of my flesh. <laughs> never mentioned blood. Blood was never mentioned. Because their flesh, the life of the flesh was in the spirit until they fell. Then the life of the flesh was in the blood. That's why God had to kill an animal to take the blood. So that's why... The blood of God Almighty had to come to the earth so that you and I could have access to the life. So we know that our fulfillment of redemption isn't completed yet, is it? Because we still have another body that's awaiting for us that don't have no blood. 
Your glorified body ain't going to have no blood because the life of your body will be in the spirit. In fact, the Bible tells us in the book of Revelations that they will be eating the fruit in the trees in the holy city. And that fruit is going to sustain your life. It's going to actually sustain your spirit. I'm not talking about blood no more. Because the Bible says flesh and blood can't enter the kingdom of God, can it? So we see here that Adam and Eve, they were placed in the garden. The Lord said, okay, you can eat all of these trees, but don't eat this one that has the seed or the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. So they were all, so obviously they were eating the tree of life, weren't they? Because they were said there was only one tree they couldn't eat from. There was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But the tree of life was there, so they were eating the tree of life also. And the other trees. So the Lord said, okay, since you disobeyed me, I'm going to have to remove you from the garden because now you know good and evil. And if you eat the tree of life, you're going to live forever knowing good and evil, but not knowing how to take dominion over it. In fact, good and evil will lead you and not life. You will sustain. In other words, if they were to eat of the tree of life, it was going to allow good and evil to reign forever. He had to remove the tree of life so that good and evil eventually would die out and it would be restored to the original where purity, holiness, and life of God, the image and likeness of Him, would be reinstated. Hallelujah. So then he had to shut down. He had to shut it down. He said, okay, this is shut down, but I got a plan. Flesh must still be maintained in the natural realm. I mean, you and I got to eat good food. We still got to drink water and eat food and so forth to maintain this flesh in the natural realm. Well, we must also eat spiritual food to maintain our spirit in the spirit realm because we'll always be led to a corruptible area because the ruler of this world is Satan. And he's always leading. And your flesh and my flesh is of the dust. Now, the Lord said to Adam, he said, I'm going to curse the ground for your sake. So if you're made of the dust, your flesh is cursed because the ground is cursed, isn't it? And what God curses is cursed. So this all started, now check this out. This all started by eating a corruptible seed. That's how this whole thing started. The seed gives birth, doesn't it? By eating a corruptible seed. Let's go to um, Psalm 51. In verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me, because everyone born into this world is born in sin. Why? From the time that Adam and Eve sinned. So they were, they're our parents. When you and I are born into this world, our true parents are Adam and Eve until we become born again and our parent becomes God. Like I said, God had a plan, didn't he? And John 3.16, let's go there. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now we know that the word believe means to what? Follow. Okay, let's go a little further. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be what? Saved. That the world might be what? saved. Let's go a little further. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe in him is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Hmm. So we see here, this is a requirement, isn't it? We must believe in the name. He tells us that God had a plan and he sent his Son into the world to save it. Save it from what? Save it from damnation because of the fall in the garden. God was out to restore. In fact, the word salvation is a representation of salvage. You know, when a ship goes down in the ocean, it's down there for a long time, isn't it? They go to what? Salvage it. It's the same thing as salvation. It means the same thing. God was sending his son into the world to save it or to salvage it and salvage those who live here. 19. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Why were their deeds evil? Because of the corruptible seed. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. So we know that the light exposes the fruits of the corruptible, deed, the corruptible seed. Amen. And verse 21. 
but he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they may have been done in God. So we see that there's two things here. The first thing is, is we must believe in the name to be saved and we must do the truth because it says in 21, but he who does the truth. So there's two things that he requires. Not only must we believe in his name, but we must do the truth. I want you to look at the name of Jesus as the seed because it says he who believes in the name is saved. Well, that means we need to have another seed, don't we? We need to have a righteous seed so that salvation or the salvaging can begin. Let's go to John 14 and verse 6. And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except for through me. Now, I want you to understand something. Jesus laid a path to life. He didn't come in saying, I am the truth, the life, and the way. He didn't say, I am the way, the life, and the truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He was setting a path for restoration. He was setting a path to bring back his children to that birth. In other words, we know that Adam and Eve were created. In other words, we could say they were born in the image and likeness of God, but they lost that image and likeness, didn't they? So God was bringing redemption to the world bringing because they needed to be brought back to that original state again of image and likeness of God because they were his son and daughter. Jesus is stating the the pathway saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And there are symbolic meanings of way, truth, and life. We know that in the Old Testament, the tabernacle was made of three sections. The outer court was known as the way. The holy place was known as the truth. And the most holy place was known as the life. And that's what the Ark of the Covenant was. So we see that there was a pathway to get to this life, wasn't there? Because new life had to become, come again reinstated as the life that was lost. So we see here now that we just said that the name of Jesus was a representation of a seed. We can say that Jesus' name was a way. Amen? We can say that the Word of God is the truth and that the Spirit of God is life. So we see it coordinates where Jesus says, I am the way, truth, and life because we know that Jesus is the name, He is the Word, and He is the life-giving Spirit, isn't He? We also know that the way is the outer court. The truth is the holy place. The life is the most holy place. We also will understand now that the way is saved. To follow the truth is life, isn't it? Jesus says, I am the way, truth, and life. I am the one who's going to save you. I am the word for you to follow. And I am the spirit that will give you new life. Acts 4 and verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to, help, to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So we see that the name saves, doesn't it? The name saves. Let's go to Acts 16 and verse 25. Now, Paul and Silas were brought in jail and they were shackled in there and, and they knew exactly what to do in the Spirit. The Bible says, sing a song of deliverance <laughs> and pray. They weren't sitting there grumbling, complaining, trying to figure out how they can saw through the bars <laughs> or waiting for someone to come and rescue them. They were seeking the kingdom of God. In verse 25 it says, But at midnight Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's chains were loose. See? I mean, this is symbolic, too. Praise and worship looses the bondages off of your life. 
And the keeper of the prison awakening from sleep and seeing the prison's doors open, supposing the prisoners he had fled, drew his sword and about to kill himself because he knew he was going to get killed for a job not well done. <laughs> but Paul, in verse 28, called with a loud voice saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? His first thought was, how am I going to be saved from the sword, from being punished? And how am I going to be saved the way you guys are? All right, let's go to verse, um, verse 31. So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Now listen, verse 32. Then they spoke what? The word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. Now remember we talked about way, truth, and life. Way was his name. What did they do then? They said, believe on the name of the Lord. And then what did they do? They spoke the word. Does everybody see that? Why? It was bringing them to a new life. Now they were speaking the word to them. So he said, believe on the name of the Lord. And they began to speak the word of the Lord to them, which was going to lead them to a new life, wasn't it? Verse 33. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and immediately he and all his family were what? Baptized. So they got baptized. So let me share something with you. The word believe means to follow, doesn't it? In other words, if you believe, that means you do something. They believed in the name of the Lord. They heard the word of the Lord and they got baptized, acknowledging that they believed. So they did something. They got baptized. They got baptized in the name of the Lord. Go to Romans 10 and verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, listen. So they had to believe on the name, and after they heard the word of the testimony that Jesus is the one that rose from the dead. Do you understand that? That represents the word, doesn't it? So they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, and they confessed with, with their mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and they believed that he was the one that rose from the dead because they heard the word. He says, then you will be what? Saved. Verse 10. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto what? Salvation. Okay. With the mouth it's unto what? Salvation. Let's go to verse um, 11. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be what? Do you understand that the name of the Lord will save you? Now let's go to 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So we see that, he says, if we confess our sins. So something has to happen. We must speak, confess. In other words, your confession activates the blood of Jesus. Nothing is manifested or activated, I should say, in the New Testament unless it's spoken. Amen. Amen? It must be spoken, which activates because it's a ministry of the Spirit, isn't it? And Spirit means breath. And let's go to confirm this. In 2 Corinthians 3, in verse 4, And we have such trust through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who has also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. So we understand that Jesus is the way, truth, and life. In other words, it's like the tabernacle, the outer court, the holy place, and the most holy place where the Spirit was. Does everybody get it? So Jesus is leading us to the Spirit. Jesus is leading me and you to the Spirit. 
Why? It's for a new life. He says, if you believe in my name, which is the way, if you follow my word, which is the truth, it will lead you to my spirit, which will bring you a new life. In verse 7, but if the ministry of the death, written and engraved on stones, which he meant the commandments, was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadfastly at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was what? Passing away. How will the what? Ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious. So we are talking about the ministry of the Spirit, and Spirit means breath. So what you speak activates the Word of God. That's why it's called the sword of the Spirit. Amen. Philippians 2. And verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Amen. It's the name above all names. The name above what? All names. Now, <clears throat> we see this layout. Now Jesus throws the curve of bringing us to a, another realm and go to John 3. So in the name of Jesus, you can be saved, right? In verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, now you got to understand something. The Jews would not call Jesus Rabbi. Uh-uh, not the Pharisees, because they were known as rabbis themselves. They had to be of their clan to be known as a rabbi. It would have been a disgrace to call Jesus Rabbi to them. Do you understand that? So this man, Nicodemus, believed in Jesus, didn't he? In fact, he had to go to him by night because he would have got probably thrown out of the Pharisees if they would have found out because they wanted to kill him, didn't they? Amen? Okay, so we see that he, he snuck at night. He believed in Jesus, didn't he? It says this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher Come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with you or with him. Now listen to this. Here this, this Pharisee sneaks out <laughs> up to Jesus and says, basically, I believe in you. Now anyone who believes in the name of Jesus or believes in him is what? Saved. saved. Nicodemus was saved. Now listen to what Jesus says. <laughs> Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He turned around and said, Nicodemus, you need to be born again. Nicodemus is like, what? Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So Jesus turns this whole thing around now and says, listen, you got to be born again. Nicodemus was saved because he believed on the name of Jesus. He believed him. But the Lord turned around and rebuked him and said, Listen, there's more for you, man. you got to be born again. Verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is what? Spirit. So Jesus puts two things here. He says... You must be born of water and of spirit. You must be born of water and of spirit to be born again. So he states here there's something more than just being saved. There's an area of being born again. Because Nicodemus was saved, wasn't he? 
But Jesus turned around and said, you need to be born again, man. Let's go to uh, Acts 1. Glory, hallelujah. So you must be born of water and what? Spirit. Water and spirit. Woohoo! To God be the glory. <clears throat> in verse 4 in chapter 1 of the book of Acts, now this is after Jesus' resurrection. He's already hung out 40 days and he's getting ready to leave. And being assembled together with them, Jesus, what did he do? Commanded, Commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait from the pro for the promise of the Father, which he said you have heard from me. Now listen, in verse 5, this is powerful. He said, John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. He just explained what he said. Jesus commanded his disciples to be what? Born again. Because he states here, you must be what? Born of water and spirit. And he says, John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So he commanded his disciples that they must be born again. And he explained the two things that they had to be done. Let's go to Titus 3. You must be born again. I mean, that's powerful that Jesus demanded and commanded his disciples to be born again. Now, they believed him, didn't they? So they were saved. Jesus rose from the dead, came back, hung around 40 days, taught them more things. And before he left, he said, I command you to be born again. And he breathed his spirit on them to sustain them so they get to their upper room and stay there. But we know that when they were born again, something else happened, didn't it? Okay, let's go to Titus 3 and verse 4. Titus chapter 3 and verse 4. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he what? Saved us. Now listen, check this is how he talks about it. He says, through the what? Washing of regeneration. Now what do you wash with? Water. Hello? Come on, get this. He says, through the washing of regeneration in the what? Renewing of the Holy Spirit. He's talking about being born again. Just exactly what he said. You must be born of water and of what? Spirit. To get a what? New life. Washing of what? Now, wait a minute now. Washing of the water. Now, we, we know that the Bible tells us that John truly baptizes with what? Water. water. I, I'm going to bring you to this area. Acts 19 right now. Acts 19, verse 1. Is everybody there? And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some what? Disciples. Now, what are disciples? Learners of Jesus Christ, aren't they? Followers, right? And Paul said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard there whether there is a Holy Spirit. So obviously they didn't, did they? So when you are saved, do you get the Holy Ghost? No. But to get saved, you must confess Jesus and repent for your sins, which is the first part of being born again, which is the water, born of water. But the second part must come in to complete the new birth. Holy Ghost. In verse 3. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? And they said, Into John's baptism. And Paul said, John indeed baptism with the baptism of what? Repentance. So, so that you're what? Saved. Saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on G Christ Jesus. Do you notice how his name changes? And we'll go to that later. It's no longer Jesus. It's Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Right? So they got baptized again. And there's nothing wrong with getting baptized more than once. If you ever break covenant with God, you want to get baptized again. And we're going to do that soon. And verse 6. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Huh? Does everybody see that? So what happened? They believed. They, they got baptized in the name of Jesus. They received Jesus again. They didn't get the Holy Ghost yet, did they? Until Paul laid hands on them, but he told them about the Holy Ghost. Then they got baptized in the Holy Ghost. So they got born of water and born of the Spirit, and they were born again. Does everybody get it? 
for John truly baptized. That's why we baptize people in water. It's known as the remission of sin. It's acknowledging that you believe exactly what the word was saying. Speak with your mouth. Confess with your mouth Jesus. Believe in your heart that he what? Rose from the dead. Why? Because he died for me and you. That's why you go in the submersion of the water. You're dying with him. And you're coming up with him. Amen? Okay. Now, I want to explain something very important. I explained to you before that the name of Jesus is a representation of a seed. When a woman gets pregnant, the child isn't birthed automatically, is it? But we know it in the spirit. It, it can be if they're baptized in the Holy Ghost. So we see that the seed is planted, isn't it? The seed is planted, and it's called conceived. When a woman is conceived, it's not birthed, is it? No. <laughs> okay. Now, I share with you that the name of Jesus is a representation of a seed. Let's go to Luke 8. Hallelujah. Luke 8. All glory to the Lamb. Luke 8. Luke chapter 8. Hallelujah. Glory to God. In Luke chapter 8 and verse um, 4. <clears throat> Luke 8 verse 4. Is everybody there? Good. <laughs> and when a great multitude had gathered and they had come to him, Jesus, from every city he spoke by a what? Parable. And what did he say? He said, a sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell on the wayside, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on the rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and knit with it and choked it. But others fell on good ground, sprang up and yielded a crop of a hundredfold. When he had said this, these things he cried, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Then his disciples asked him, saying, What does this parable mean? And he said, To you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it has been given in parables that, that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Mm. The seed is the what? Word. Word of God. Now, let's go to Mark 4. Mark 4. <clears throat> Hallelujah. The seed is the what? Word. The Word of God. Mark 4. And Mark explains this in the same way, but I just want to share something with you and what he picked up more on and what Jesus said in verse 13. In Mark 4. And he, Jesus, said to them, do you not understand this parable? And it's a parable about the sower and the seed, right? Now he explained to them and he said, How then will you understand all the parables? Now he expressed something powerful here. He said, Listen, if you can't understand this parable, how are you going to understand the rest? Understand this. A parable is a parallel between the spirit and the natural. Does everybody understand that? A parable is a parallel between the spirit and the natural. And the natural, because that which, you know, in Ecclesiastes, the Bible says, there's nothing new under the sun. So what Jesus was doing was expressing the things of the Spirit with drawing a picture with a parable and the natural for them to understand the things of the Spirit. Does everybody understand that? He says, if you don't understand this parable, how are you going to understand the rest? And what was he trying to do? He was trying to bring understanding to them of the parallel between the Spirit and the natural. Okay? So when you read parables... You're actually getting the parallel of the spirit realm or a message from the spirit realm brought forth in the natural realm for understanding. Okay? Good. In verse 14, now he says, The sower sows the word or the what? Seed. Remember the Bible says that the seed is the word. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown or the seed is sown, right? When they hear who comes. Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their heart. Or he takes away the seed. Now we said that the name of Jesus was a representation of what? The seed. So you think Satan can come and steal that seed that's called spiritual abortion. 
called spiritual abortion. That child never got birthed. Amen. Now listen. Watch. Let's go to John 1. John 1. <clears throat> John 1 and verse 1, of course, it says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay? In verse 14, it says, And the Word became what? Flesh. flesh. And what else became flesh? The seed. The seed became flesh. Does everybody get this? The seed became flesh. Why? Because the Word is the seed. And the Word became flesh. So if the Word became flesh, the seed had to become flesh. Is everybody with me? And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory and the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and what? Truth. Jesus is the Word or the seed that became flesh, isn't He? His name had to become flesh because the Word became flesh. So the name of Jesus is actually a representation of the Word becoming flesh, isn't it? It's actually the name of God, isn't it? <laughs> now go to Isaiah 53. But the Bible says that Satan comes and steals that seed. Isaiah 53. Oh, Jesus, help us. Glory to God. Isaiah 53 and... Verse 10, and we're all going to read this. Because <clears throat> Isaiah prophesied the seed that was coming. In verse 10, let's read it. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief when you made his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Who is Jesus? The seed of God. Jesus is the seed of God. Does everybody get it? Now, Jesus is a representation of the word. They didn't know Jesus is the Christ yet, did they? Until he was baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now go to John 1. John chapter 1 again. So we see here that Jesus is the seed. So, you see, you can be saved and not born again. That's why when those who are not born again or baptized in the Holy Ghost are not born again, they have tr troubles, don't they? They have no power, you know. They, and, and don't get me wrong, the seed can still be there, can it? And just the seed's presence alone is making a change in your life. Does everybody understand that? But there isn't that new birth yet. <laughs> Because even a seed in a woman, uh, when, a, when, a, when a woman is conceived, so I want you to understand that being saved is a representation of conceived. Somebody who is saved is conceived. Okay? Conceived to what? To be born again in the image and likeness of Christ. And John 1, verse 29. We'll get there. Hold on. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said... After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So we see Jesus was the example, wasn't he? Jesus was known as the Word that became flesh. Jesus is a representation of the Word. He lived on this earth for 30 years. He did no miracles. He didn't do, you know, he didn't proclaim to be the Son of God, did he? He went to church. He did all the right things. But yet he went and got baptized in water as the example for me and you and then got baptized in the Holy Ghost as the example for me and you. After Jesus was baptized in the Holy Ghost, he proclaimed to be the Christ and not before. That's when he said, who do they say that I am? Does everybody get it? Okay. So Jesus' name represented the, Christ, the word. Now, Jesus is known as Christ Jesus. 
because Christ means an anointing, right? Or anointed one. The anointed word. Does everybody get it? Because he was no longer as Jesus. He was known as the Christ. In fact, we know that in, in I think it's in Luke uh, 4, 8 or 4, 18, it says that G Jesus' first preaching was the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. So understand, Jesus was always leading people to the Spirit. Does everybody get it? Jesus was always leading. He says, I am the way, truth, and life. The name was the way. The truth is the word, and the life is the Spirit. Always leading me and you to the Spirit. He said it to his disciples, it's to your advantage that I leave, so that the Comforter can come, the Spirit of truth, and guide you to all truth. Why? So that it can be born again. Hallelujah. Okay. 1 Samuel 10. Jesus was a new man after he got baptized in the Holy Ghost, wasn't he? He was known as the Christ. <laughs> because he was what? Born again. Hallelujah. In 1 Samuel 10. Glory to the Lamb. 1 Samuel chapter 10. Now remember we talked about... Um, the Holy Spirit brings birth, right? The Holy Spirit brings birth. The Holy Spirit is the one that births the seeds. Jesus was known as the seed of God. When the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jesus, he brought birth. The Christ was born, birthed. Does everybody understand that? Now we know that, uh, you, you'll read in the, in the Word that, um, um, I think it was what, uh, Ananias, or who, found, who, who was there at Jesus' um, on the eighth day when he was, circumcised, uh, I think it was Ananias, I, I don't remember his name, but he was the one that said, I'm, and I would live to see the Christ come. See, he knew he was the Christ, but he wasn't birthed as the Christ yet. Do you understand what I'm saying? Hey, uh, the Christ wasn't manifest, he was just come into the world, but the Christ wasn't formed yet until he got baptized with the Holy Ghost. He was known as the Word, Jesus, the Word. Okay, 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 1. Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head, and this is Saul, who is going to become king, and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his what? Inheritance. Now, Adam and Eve, when God created Adam and Eve, we go back to this again. In his likeness and image, they were to what? Be fruitful and multiply, representing inheritance. The Holy Spirit had to come on Saul so he can become in the image and likeness of Christ, God, so that he can handle his inheritance. Watch. In uh, verse 6. So Samuel tells Saul, he anoints him with oil, and he says, look, the Lord has anointed you. Now the manifestation of the anointing didn't come yet. Samuel anointed him with the oil. Now Samuel was giving him direction how to get the anointing so he can become, so he can handle the inheritance of God. In verse 6 it says, now Samuel tells him to go with the prophets and so forth. In verse 6 it says now, Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and you will prophesy with them, and you will be turned into a what? Another man. Another man. And what other man is that? A new man, the new birth, born again. To what? Handle the, remember, I, look, at without that new birth, the promises, the inheritance of God is not being fulfilled in your life. That's why people who are just saved, you, you know, you can tell by their fruits that, Things aren't right. They're struggling and trying to do it in their own strength. Because, they're, you know, hey, listen, I believed in Jesus many for a long time, but I was never born again. Amen. I was out serving the devil. The devil was stealing that seed, wasn't he? Yep. Every time the Lord tried to bring me to a place to get birth again, yep. the devil convinced me, caused spiritual abortion. Yep. How many times have people gone to, gone to the altar and received Jesus Christ again over and over and over because the devil steals that seed? Causes spiritual abortion, they never got birthed again. Why do you think we have hospital ministries? Because people are dying on their de deathbed, on that hospital bed. And you go there and you say, listen, repent and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. When they do, they are saved and they'll go home. But they're not born again, are they? Because only the Holy Ghost can birth that seed. But it will get them home, won't they? That's why Paul said it would be better to turn them over to Satan. That their flesh can be destroyed but their soul can be saved, okay? So somebody can even be born again and go back to a saved position and go back to a lost position. Is everybody with me? So somebody can be born again, 
and go back to that saved position and then go to a lost position. Okay, let's go a little further. So when you are saved, you're conceived. You're conceived to be birthed. And who's the birther? The Holy Spirit. Okay? And what's happening is that corruptible seed, which is known as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, is now your flesh. Your flesh is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, isn't it? It's not gone, is it? It's still there. That part of redemption hasn't manifested yet. But God has given us power to take dominion over that part until it is redeemed. Does everybody get it? See, your soul is redeemed. Your spirit is born. Does everybody understand that? Your soul is being renewed, isn't it? Through the word. Your spirit gets born again. Your flesh is not redeemed yet. It's taken dominion or crucified by being led by the spirit. And we'll go there. Okay? So when you are saved, you are conceived to be born again. Does everybody understand this? Okay. Hallelujah. Now, that goes back to, um, hold on to this, all right? Now, hold on. So saved is conceived, right? The Holy Spirit births that seed. You ready for this? The word conceived is a representation of conception, isn't it? Conception means being conceived in the womb, all right? The beginning or process of an idea is a representation of conceived or conception. In fact, God thought, right? God thought about man coming, right? God thought. When he thought, he conceived, didn't he? There was conception, wasn't there? Hold on. Now listen. When the Lord took the dust of the earth, he conceived man. When he breathed in him, man was birthed. Is everybody with me? When the Lord took the dust of the earth, Man was conceived. He formed man out of the earth, didn't he? The dust of the earth. Man was conceived in the thought, in the process of a beginning, because conception is a representation, the beginning or process of an idea. The Lord conceived Adam by taking him and forming him out of the dust of the ground. Adam was conceived. Adam was birthed or born when he breathed in him the breath of life. Does everybody get it? Hallelujah. Because it's the spirit that what? Brings life. Let's go to 1 John 3. 1 John 3. Glory to God. First John chapter 3. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb. And uh, verse, okay, all right, hold your finger there. First John chapter 3, I want you to go to James 1. I don't want to lose sight of this conception here, okay? James 1, James 1. Remember I shared with you that thought of conception. It was the beginning. Conception is a representation of what? A beginning of an idea or a process of something. God conceived Adam by the dust of the ground. He formed him. And when he breathed the breath of life in him, Adam became born. He birthed him. All right? Okay. Now, in James 1, in verse 14. James 1, verse 14. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed, or own ideas, isn't it? Then when the desires or ideas have what? Conceived it what? Gives what? Birth. You get it? <laughs> to what? Sin or to life, right? One or the other. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death or brings forth life. Does everybody get it? Not sin, but what I'm talking about is the understanding of conception. So when the thought is conceived, amen? When the thought, just listen, isn't that what happens to people that fall and backslide? That thought gets conceived. It's called a seed of corruption that gets imparted. And the devil waters it till it becomes birthed. And then what happens? It leads to death. See, the devil wants to steal your righteous seed and impart a corruptible seed in you. That's his job. Now I'll go to 1 John. 1 John chapter 3. 
That's why the Bible says cast down all thoughts and imagination because that's where those corruptible seeds are imparted. Amen. That's exactly how Satan conned Eve. Amen. Planted a corruptible seed. Okay. In, in 1 John 3 and chapter 3 and verse 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he who is Jesus is righteous. He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. In other words, you have a part of destroying the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. Or he does not let sin have dominion over him. Do you understand that? It doesn't mean that you won't do something. But it means that you won't allow sin to reign in your life. Now look at Whoever has been born of God does not sin for his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he has been born of God or born again. Because a born again individual has dominion over sin. But that, now, that born again individual can be removed from that born again state and go back to that saved state to where sin is reigning in his life. Amen? So it's our responsibility to maintain that born again State, state of being. And First Peter 1. Oh, glory to God, a few more scriptures and, and praise be to God. First Peter 1. Oh, hallelujah, this is good. Holy Ghost food. First Peter 1 and verse 23. Somewhere around there. Let's see. First Peter 1, verse 22. Let's do it for me and you. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth, remember we talked about that, through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. Huh. So already we see born again is a representation of the incorruptible seed or the righteous seed being birthed. Does everybody get it? And we see that his seed remains, doesn't it? His seed remains. So we know that his seed can be stolen, can it? That's why. Hey, there are people who just who I've seen baptized in the Holy Ghost, praying in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, and after a period of time, backsliding and walking away from God. And actually denouncing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I've seen it. it blows my mind. Hallelujah. First John 5. In verse 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the what? Christ. Christ. You know, it's, it's, it's even difficult to understand what Christ is unless you are born again. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, we've, people know, well, Jesus is the Christ, but they really never understood what the Christ means. It means the anointed one and his anointing the Holy Spirit is a representation. Jesus was not the Christ until the mantle of the anointing of Christ came upon him. Okay? So most people don't even know what the Christ means. So unless you understand what the Christ means, it means you ain't born again. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him, who begot also loves him, who is begotten of him or birthed of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. And this is the love of God that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not burdensome. Why? Because the anointing of Christ allows us to walk in the power of obedience. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Does everybody get it? So if you are born of God, you're overcoming the ways of the world. That means born again. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. I'll go to verse 18. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin. But he who has been born of God, what? Keeps himself and the wicked one does not touch him. So you must stay in that born again state. That means walking in Christ. Because you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you through the anointing. It means walking in the Spirit. 
we know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know Him who is true and we are in Him who is true in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little, keep, little children, keep yourselves from what? Idols. Praise be to God. Now, go to 2 Corinthians 5. No, 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 no. Let's go to Galatians 3. Go to Galatians 3. Praise be to God. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26. Is everybody there? Let's read this together, please. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. You understand how it, His name changes? Christ Jesus. Faith in Christ Jesus, knowing that He is the Anointed One and His anointing. He is more than just a word. He is the Anointed One. For as many of you as were baptized in Christ, meaning baptized in the Holy Spirit, has put on Christ. See, there's a difference between baptizing and remission of sin and being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Being baptized in the Holy Spirit means you are baptized in Christ. And now you have put on Christ. Verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ. Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, if you are Christ, if you are the offspring of the anointed one and the anointing, then you are Abraham's what? Seed. And heirs according to the promise. <laughs> Come on, let's go. Uh, chapter 4 and verse 6. And because you are sons of God, has, but because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Because God is Spirit. That's where you know Him in relationship as Father. When I was baptized in the Holy Ghost, I realized that He was my Daddy. Hallelujah. And verse 7, Therefore you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through what? Christ, the Anointed One and His anointing. Go to Romans 8. Romans 8. Is everybody all right? I know it's a lot. It's a lot. But it's cool. We need to get this understanding. Romans 8 and verse 12. Romans 8, verse 12. Let's read this together. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit... You put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. Now listen, he's saying you didn't receive the spirit of the Lord again to fear. I mean the spirit of the world again to fear. Do you understand that? Why? Because you and I were born of the spirit of the world. Now we're reborn of the spirit of God. Does everybody get it? That's why when we read that um, in, the, in, the, in the Psalm 51, verse 5, where he says, and I was, I was born in iniquity, and my mother birthed me in her womb in what? Sin. Does everybody understand that? So you and I were born in sin. Why? Because we were born in the spirit of this world. That's why Satan's known as this, this, the prince of power of what? Darkness. And the prince of the power of what? Air. <laughs> so we were born in sin. We are actually his children. But there's an age of accountability, do you understand? That's why all children, if they're aborted and they die before the age of accountability, go home Amen. to heaven. But there's a point of the age of accountability where now we are accountable to get born again, to get saved, okay? Because we are born in sin. Hallelujah. Now listen. So we did not receive the spirit of bondage again because he's talking to people that are born again to fear. But you receive the spirit of adoption where you cry out, Abba, Father. Abba means Daddy. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with... Second Corinthians, in verse 16. Fied together with Him. Go to Second Corinthians 5. Is everybody there? Let's read this together. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh... 
even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer, because we know he's spirit, isn't he? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, meaning the anointed one and his anointing, in Christ, meaning baptized in the spirit, because it's called the baptism of Christ, he is a new creation. He is born again. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's why somebody was just saved. Old things are not passed away yet. Everybody get it? But when they're born again, old things have passed away. Their desires and things are different now. Totally different. Now we know that, let's go to Galatians, um, Galatians 5 for a second. Galatians 5. You know, we know, it tells us about the fruits of the spirit, the fruits of the flesh, right? In verse 22, 5.22, Galatians 5.22, it says, But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, hello, against their, such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the what? Flesh, flesh with its passions and desire. Come on, man. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. But I want to share with you one other thing. Turn to Mark 16. Those are known as the fruits of the Spirit, aren't they? Those who are walking in the Spirit. Hallelujah. In Mark 16. In verse 16. Mark 16 and verse 16. And these are the fruits of born again. And he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe or follow me. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. That's a born again individual. They will take up serpents and if they drink anything deadly, by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. In conclusion... You can be saved and not born again. But how long? Hmm. Born again. Born again is one who is baptized in the Holy Ghost. You know, when you are born again, I mean, think about it. When the baby comes out of, when the baby is conceived and then it brings birth, the first thing they wait for is a sound from that baby. It has a tongue. When you get born again, you get a tongue. Amen. It's called tongues. That's the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's the sign of the baptism of the new birth. Does everybody get it? What do they do? They slap the baby on the butt. Holy Ghost comes over and slaps the soul out of you. <laughs> so that you can get birth. Remember, the seed to be saved is conceived. To be born again is for the seed to be birthed. And only the Holy Ghost brings birth. Mm -hmm.